you're listening to the SAS Says Podcast. I'm your host, Christy Rocha, also known as SAS. I identify as a woman, a wife, and a mother. That should tell you a lot already. And over the last few years, I've learned the value of talk therapy. I have seen how my inner work not only enhances my own well-being, but also my marriage, my parenting, my relationships. And in fact, you wouldn't be hearing this right now if it weren't for the work I've done. My mission is to debunk the misconceptions and stigmas around what therapy is and who it's for. Let's normalize working on our mental health and seeking help when needed. We've all heard of self-care, self-help, and self-love, but do you often wonder how to actually make it all happen? I do. You'll hear strategy-based conversations with professionals, as well as inspiring and validating stories from women who are just like you and me. Think of this podcast as the weekly therapy sessions you didn't know you needed, with a dash of sass, a lot of vulnerability, and me, relentlessly asking, but how? Hi, hi, hi. I'm so excited for you to hear this episode today. My guest is Gemma Rain. Gemma is an influential speaker, entrepreneur, and certified personal development coach. She inspires individuals and organizations to learn the life-changing skills used to cultivate meaningful connection to self and others as she guides people to greater self-awareness and fulfillment. Gemma is a compassionate and insightful thought leader whose first TikTok video immediately went viral, reaching 4.5 million views. Her keen ability to warmly connect with her audience not only leads to the authenticity of her message, but gives them the invaluable experience of being seen, understood, and supported. Gemma courageously weaves her story with knowledge gained during a decade plus of skillfully coaching clients through personal and relational transformation. She empowers people with a unique synthesis of relational intelligence, well-being practices, and methods to break free from the constraints of conditioning that compromises our self-worth, the quality of our relationships, and our happiness. Oh my goodness. And you bet your butt we get into all of this. We talk about Gemma's story, including her divorce from a quote-unquote nice guy after 20 years of marriage. What actually is the crisis of connection and what can you do about it in your relationships? We talk about the emotional load and labor in relationships and how gender norms and roles play a huge role in the emotional health of our relationships. We also talk about what Gemma calls the assumption of love, the types of intimacy, and how to break generational relationship cycles for our kids. Basically, you're getting a little relationship boot camp today. I will not wait a second longer. Here's Gemma. Hey, Gemma. Thank you so much Hi. for being here. Thank you for having me, Christy. I'm, uh, it's so funny when I do this and I say this every time my listeners are probably sick of hearing it, but when I interview someone that I've watched on social media for so long, it's like, whoa, there you are. Yeah. Yeah. I know. <laughs> you know? Yes. Yeah. yeah, exactly. I feel yeah. That too. yeah. I, um, you know what? I usually do this at the end, but considering how I, you know, found you, so to speak, mm-hmm. um, I feel like I was there when you had like two TikTok videos, three TikTok videos and it felt like overnight you yeah. went viral. Like, it is that it, accurate? Yeah, it, it is accurate. I mean, it wasn't even on my radar that that was a possibility. I, yeah. I, it took me so long to get the guts to even come forward and share that very first video that went viral. And I'm a, quite a private person. I'm very comfortable being vulnerable one-on-one, but to speak publicly, to share not just my thoughts, but a little bit of my uh, story was terrifying. So yeah. I really thought maybe five people who know me will watch it, right? And then yeah. I checked in an hour later and I could see the numbers, right? And it was my son who, you know, is a, a 20 year old and said, mom, it's going viral. And I said, oh no, I don't, I don't think that, but just more people than I was expecting are watching it. So yeah, it was overnight. Yeah. Yeah. Cause I, it, it came on my for you page and, you know, I went to your page and I was like, oh, she's new like wow yeah, this is wild yeah, yeah like I was like yeah. whoa this is crazy yeah. I mean I was having this conversation last night with Jax Anderson she's um on TikTok as well a pretty big account and 
it does seem pretty arbitrary. You know, there, yeah, yeah. there are components of a video that make it more likely to be pushed, right? But mm -hmm. it does seem pretty arbitrary that like, it just happens. It's crazy. Yeah, I think it's that. And I think it's also the combination of a number of factors, right? It's like when you see a movie that really resonates, it's not just the writing, it's not just the actors, it's not just the directing, right? It's kind of everything together. And yes, there are some amazing videos on TikTok that just don't get the play, right? right? That they yeah. deserve. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I've sort of opened this conversation up on my platforms about you know, content creation and mental mm -hmm. health. I mm -hmm. mean, when you hear that, what is it like for you now? I mean, you mentioned being kind of more comfortable speaking one-on-one -on -one vulnerably mm -hmm. and things like that. Like what's challenging for you and how do you, how do you deal with it as far as creating content and, and maintaining your mental health? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, what I've learned is to really check in with myself of like, do you want to post today or are you telling yourself that you should? And then for me, it's not really going to come from the heart mm -hmm. if it's a should. Uh, and so, and, and even still, it takes a lot for me to step forward, especially certain videos where I am sharing, you know, some of my personal story. Mm -hmm. uh, so it feels like, am I excited about sharing an idea today? Uh, have I had a theme play out with clients this week that feels like that's giving me some drive? Like, oh, I, I think it's important for people to know this because I'm hearing the same thing in so many sessions this week. So it's that kind of internal motivation mm -hmm. that will give me the energy and the inspiration. Mm -hmm. I, I don't, if it's like, oh, I haven't posted in this many days, I still feel that yeah. pressure of like, I'm letting people down or, you know, but it's, doesn't motivate me as much. So that's yeah. why you notice I, I'm not posting every day. Yeah. Right. And there's all these ideas about like the consistency and you have to post this many each day. And oh, yeah. I, I actually never even participated in social media until that very first TikTok video. That is wild. Yeah. That is wild. Oh because my it didn't feel for me, uh, other people are amazing at it. It didn't really, all the other platforms just didn't feel authentic to how I connect with people. Mm -hmm. And then when my daughter teen introduced me to TikTok during the pandemic, and initially it was a lot of dancing and stuff. And then when mental health professionals started joining it, she's saying, mom, it's not, I love the dancing too, but it's not just dancing and cute cat videos. Right. So you'll love this. So right. she introduced me to that. And at the time I was moving through the ending of my, you know, 20 year marriage. And it was so helpful to me because I could connect to the people because there were, because they were videos. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I thought I now for the first time ever feel a pull towards this, towards a social media platform. Yeah. Yeah. That's awesome. Because as a consumer, it's really easy to spot when someone's just doing it because they should not. Yes because it's feeling right. Yeah. Yeah, yeah absolutely. And, and it's also like that, that first video for me, it was really um, discouraging to me that people, I didn't think enough people were talking about what, what was actually going on in relationships. Mm -hmm. And a, a lot of the, you know, what I was sharing, I've been thinking about for you, like I, like I share my videos, I was raised by a therapist. So was my ex-husband, our mothers were actually uh, business partners they had a practice together that's how we met yeah <laughs> your face you're like what it's um, wild yeah. Yeah. wow and so um so that was the language that we spoke so some of this I knew and I thought that we had the skills to uh avoid what happened at the end of our marriage which, which was disconnection right mm -hmm. um and I thought why and so I also knew for all those years from my mother talking about it that most hetero divorces were initiated by women. Yeah. Right. And I thought, why is nobody talking about this? And why is nobody? And then I got even more curious about what is leading up to that. Because if we talk about it more, then maybe we can prevent it. Yeah. Okay. All right. So let's get into it. Why, why then become a coach? Like what, what was the push to a coach as opposed to a therapist? Like you were raised by a therapist. Why do the specific type of coaching that you do? Uh, for one, it's just a, a, a better fit for me. I okay. love therapists. Uh, for me, that integration of insight and action. And again, it's really tricky because when you talk to 
coaches and therapists and people who have had both, you can't really meet neatly fit them into different boxes, mm -hmm. right? There is overlap. A coach will describe what they do and a therapist goes, well, I do some of that too, mm -hmm. vice versa, right? So for me though, uh, I, 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 I think my coaching is therapeutic, mm -hmm. right? But a lot of my clients are coming to me after they've gone to therapy. So they already have some insight, right? And to me, it's, um, again, this is not a, a neat distinction, but the difference between healing and growth, even though you do grow as you heal. Mm -hmm. So uh, it's just, I, I'm very compassionate about the suffering that mm -hmm. my clients are experiencing. And I think it's really important to acknowledge that my type of coaching, it's not all about action. Mm -hmm. It's about working with what's going on internally okay. so that then we can get to the action piece and we're making better decisions about how to take action. So I love that. I love that integration of what do we do now that we have the insight? Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. So what are you seeing out there right now? Like what are the challenges going on with just your current client base without obviously being specific, but what are you seeing out there? What are the, I guess maybe relationships is, is kind of the, the meat and potatoes, right? So what mm -hmm. are the relationship challenges you're seeing out there right now? Uh, so disconnection. Okay. Is, is the big one. I really think that relationships suffer, that what leads a lot of them to end is not attending to the disconnection that's taking place. And that we've been, uh, we understand disconnection that comes from direct confrontation, right? From partners being disrespectful and criticizing each other and speaking over each other and all of that. But I think the one that flies under the radar a little bit is the disconnection that comes from withdrawal, mm. right? So, uh, uh, so people going kind of quiet, people not actively nurturing love, right? And, and, and I talk about relationships, both the relationship you have with yourself and the one that you have with your partner. And, and it's the same skills you're using, mm -hmm. right? The ones that can improve the connection with your partner same skills as improving the connection with yourself, right? Mm -hmm. Get curious rather than making assumptions and move away from certainty into curiosity, move into exploration. Um, so, you, you know, it's a crisis of connection and under that umbrella is what we've been told for years is effective communication, is conflict resolution skills. And how do we consciously and intentionally nourish healthy connection mm -hmm. and how? that's how do we do yeah that? <laughs> yeah okay so yeah so how I know do, you're so, a how person so how, how, how do we do that yeah yeah uh you know in a so, nutshell <laughs> it, well yeah it's it's a lot of factors it's um it's understanding that one it's like thinking about the the mindsets and what we've been told about relationships so I think a lot of us have been led to believe that that commitment is you know, the, the, and the duration of time that we're together is the main indicator of how a relationship is doing, which is why you hear people say, you know, with great pride, oh, we've been together this many years, or my parents or grandparents are that I'm like, and right. what's going on within that, right? So it's, it's just not enough. So it's um, playing around with the balance of how are you um, growing yourself and how you're growing the relationship. So what are your interests? What are your passions? What lights you up? What shuts you down? And remaining curious about that for your partner too, mm -hmm. so that you continue believing there's more to explore, right? And it's 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 tricky because, and I think uh, Esther Perel, the therapist Esther Perel talks about this a lot, uh, in terms of the balance of wanting to have a sense of safety and security, with our partner, which is, I feel I really know you, I know everything about you, um, but if you're, it, and that makes sense, but at the same time, if you think you know everything about your partner, everything about yourself, you've stopped exploring. And so things go kind of flat mm -hmm. and you make all kinds of assumptions about yourself and the other. So how can you keep exploring? How can you add in some novelty? Or for some couples, you know, they'll say, well, this is my best friend and we do everything together. And I think, uh oh, right. Mm -hmm. Because sometimes there's too much closeness. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And, you know, uh, uh, I think it's, 
I, I just think it's maybe healthier to say this is one of my best friends. Yeah. Yeah. Right. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. So it's, it's partially a, a, a big factor here in the how is sharing the uh, emotional load. Okay. So this is something that especially can affect uh, heteronormative couples because mm-hmm. heteronormative couples are most rigidly adhere to societal norms about gender, mm-hmm. right? Like queer couples will play around with it a little more. <laughs> they will, they're, they're, they're just more creative in that way, right? Mm-hmm. But even still, when you take the things that, uh, when you take household responsibilities, childcare responsibilities, financial responsibilities, when those, when there's an equal partnership in those three areas, right? So you can put that to the side. Every couple has all kinds of uh, emotional challenges in there because of, of um, pain points from childhood, mm-hmm. right? But in, in hetero couples, it, we, we've all internalized these myths about that me- women have more capacity for emotional expression and processing. And, and so then um, like the therapist Harriet Lerner talks about how from birth, if a baby is identified as male, they're, they're shamed for half of their humanness, mm-hmm. right? They're shamed for anything that is deemed feminine. Mm-hmm. So that to me is really at the core of a lot of relationship issues. And you will still see that play out in same sex relationships where they think the options are one person takes on the role of provider and the other one is nurturer. Right. right. Rather than how can we share, right? So for women, we are told that our greatest value is in nurturing others. Mm-hmm. And men are told that their value is in doing rather than being, is in providing and protecting, right? It's very limited then our sense of value. Mm -hmm. So if we could understand that as humans, we're we're much more similar. We all have the same wiring for emotional uh, awareness Mm -hmm. and processing and expression. There are there some differences, sure, but we all, for example, we all have mirror neurons in our brains. They help us, you know, understand what someone else is feeling and experiencing. Hmm. I think that's worth like reiterating that we're all wired for emotionally ex- expressing ourselves. And, yep. you know, I think, like you said, we just, we give men a pass a lot on that and and like you said it's not always it's not like their fault right this is often how they're raised from the time they're born absolutely right absolutely and then think about that's like for them right yeah like what do you what do you notice if you're observing men in terms of emotional expression what's been your experience of where do I notice it of of observing you know how they move through life yeah I mean I I, how far can we go back right I mean (laughs) right it's like I can think back to relationships that I've had as, as in high school and college where, Mm -hmm. you know, you're just, I remember just feeling like what's going on. Yeah. (laughs) You know, we kind of joke about the, having the quote unquote talk, right? Like, where are we? And it's like, who initiates that almost every time Mm -hmm. Uh, the girl, you know, because Mm -hmm. she gets to a point where she just can't stand not knowing anymore. Or, Mm -hmm. you know, I remember Mm -hmm. kind of acting like a girlfriend for a long time and being like, Mm -hmm. am I though? (laughs) Like, are you actually emotionally committed to me? Because yep. I don't know, you know? Yep. yep. Um, I see, yeah, I, I see it in even just being at a playground with my kids, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. You see, you know, there being a little more leniency for boys to be rough, you know? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, and just if they fall, it's like, get up. <laughs> Yeah, you right. Know? So there's le- leniency and there's also something, you know, and, and, and then for them, yeah, we, we will set the bar really low yeah. for, for boys, for men. At the same time, the cost of that is, is just terrible for them, right? They are steered away from understanding their own emotional landscape. It's that man up message. Like you said, on a playground, a little boy falls and it's get up, yeah. right? Shake it off. A little girl, everyone goes rushing to her, 
right? Uh, it hurts each child just as much. And then if you go, if you go even younger, though, you see more of the similar, you see the sensitivity, mm -hmm. you know, we all have sensitivities, totally. yeah. like I have a boy and a girl, there was no difference in terms of their ability to tap into what they were feeling and what their friends were feeling, right? Mm -hmm. So it's, mm -hmm. uh, you know, my ex and I have been very intentional about exploring that with both of our kids. So mm -hmm. that might be, and yet my son, uh, who has very high emotional intelligence will say the challenge is like, and, and, and I see this with men, they're still feel, they still feel like they have to compartmentalize yes. those emotional intelligence skills. Right. right? Yeah. Like we so. can do all this work at home, but then they still have to go out into the world and mm -hmm. be a man. <laughs> you yeah. Know? Yeah. They'll have to find a way everybody, you know, you know, they still have to find a way to relate to their peers and, mm -hmm. you know, be part of the group and, and be understood and heard mm -hmm. in a way that, you know, so society culturally, we want to understand them and we want to hear from them. Yeah. I think it's like when you, what I notice is when you give men the opportunity, like a very, uh, like a safe space, as they say, to uh, explore that part of themselves, it's all been sitting there the whole time. Yeah. They, yeah. they tap into it faster than they realize. And then what is really exciting to me is watching how kind of thrilled they are with, with themselves in terms of lear learning more about themselves, like expanding mm -hmm. their self-knowledge and understanding their capacity mm -hmm. for emotional intelligence and relational intelligence. I mean, I think that's the other thing too, is learning to think in a more relational way, which mm -hmm. again, women are conditioned yeah. for that from a young age like yeah. we are you know we are encouraged to have a lot of these like face-to-face -face intimate conversations with mm -hmm. our friends mm -hmm. right and men are steered more towards shoulder to shoulder almost like parallel play yeah yeah totally right yeah, yeah I just pictured like a line of 90 football players like standing right. shoulder to shoulder in pads you know <laughs> right and, yeah. and 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 it leads to some very painful emotional loneliness yeah. Right. And so that's the other thing, as you mentioned, it's women who are often initiating those. Can we talk, you mm -hmm. know, moments uh, because, again, we, we because of that emotional labor, we've been told that's ours to carry. Mm -hmm. And so we're monitoring the closeness in the relationship. Right. So that's something that, you know, I talk about in terms of the ending of my marriage, that even though my ex has a lot of these skills, uh, we, we were still impacted by internalizing all that gender norm stuff, right? So I was the one initiating those conversations and saying in a calm way, hey, I'm, I'm concerned about us. We feel disconnected. I'm feeling lonely in the relationship. Mm -hmm. And we know, because we were raised by there, we know that that's like the kiss of death, mm -hmm. right? If this continues, so I, I really want to jump on this now because mm -hmm. prolonged disconnection you know, we, we, we then become self-protective in a different way. Then I started pulling it. Oh, I don't really feel cared for. If you don't return to this conversation, if there's no check-in after I've initiated it, mm -hmm. you know, and yeah. So, so what did that, what did that look like for you? Like what did the disconnection in your relationship look like on a, you know, daily, weekly basis? Yeah. So for us, uh, it meant less, less quality time together. It meant both people getting kind of absorbed in, you know, and again, he was thinking in terms of that, that way he's been socialized, right? It was like, but I'm doing the noble thing. I'm working hard for the family. And I was sitting there saying, I'm working just as hard. Mm -hmm. You know, we're working the same number of hours. Mm -hmm. And yet now suddenly I'm taking on even more of the parental stuff, mm -hmm. you know? Um, it meant that our conversations, we were always very respectful of each other. And so it, for me, the, the conversations were pleasant and friendly, mm -hmm. but they started to feel a little too uh, surface. Too friendly, right? Like, yeah. Too, yeah. Like, too much like friends almost, right? Exactly. It's like if, you know, the way I think about it is if you're having these, if you would have these conversations with your neighbors who you're friendly with, and we did live in the neighborhood where we talked a lot to our then- this doesn't feel that special to me yeah. anymore. It's not going, it's not going deep enough. This is, and, and also it's not very interesting to me. Right. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So it was, it was that the, the 
the connection, the meaningful connection was not being nourished. The relationship was not a priority, mm -hmm. right? And I, I, and it's another thing we have to play around with. I can't always be the priority right. when you have career, when you have kids, mm -hmm. but it has to be a priority. And I, mm -hmm. and I, I think people slide into um, the assumption of love, passive love. Mm -hmm. of like of course I love you mm -hmm. and so then it doesn't feel like love mm -hmm. and then it slides more into a relationship for some people that's 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 about care mm -hmm. right care is an element of love but it's not enough for the relationship yeah. to feel like like the example that I give is when my son's away at uh, a university I will send him care packages packages of his favorite foods, right? It's a, it's one of the ways that I am showing him, I, I care for you. I'm thinking about you. I love you. Um, at the same time, if I only did that, right. I don't think he would actually feel that loved. Right. Right. I ha so when he calls me, I'm going to be fully engaged and present in those conversations to celebrate what he's excited about and to um, tune into what's, you know, causing him distress. Mm -hmm. You know, we, we need both pieces. Yeah. Okay. So, okay. You know, the, the passive, the assumption of love, the passive love, like that, as you were talking, I was also thinking about how we also tend to show love the way we want to receive it mm -hmm. because that's what we know. Right. So mm -hmm where would we start to address some of this? Like, how is it, is it just like sitting down and having a conversation? Like, give us some language to use if, if we're feeling disconnected from our partner, you know, where do we start to bridge the gap? Yeah, I think it's, it's in part, it's, it's conversations and knowing you don't have to solve it all in one sitting. I think mm. that's another thing that people get overwhelmed is they think like it's all going to be solved in one conversation. It's not, it's really good to take breaks because in those pauses, you gain more insight in those pauses, you can experiment a little bit. So a conversation around, and we know like, for example, in, in a hetero couple that, that as soon as men hear the, can we talk? Yeah. You know, they, a lot of them are thinking how fast can this be over? Just get me <laughs> out of this. Right. Yeah, so, yeah. so knowing that you could start it with like, Hey, I would love your help on something. Mm. You know, I've been thinking about some stuff and I like, and also ask, is this a good time? Yeah. You know, do you, do you have the, the energy right now to, to have a conversation about a relationship? Cause I would love your help. Mm -hmm. Right. So that it's a, it's a, how can we not, I need you to do this, this, and this, mm -hmm. and, you know, like triggering their sensitivity around inadequacy, yeah. but here and talk, really talk about how you're feeling in it. I, and, and I think it's very helpful to say, I would, I would love for you to just listen in order to understand me better. Mm -hmm. Right. And then I'm going to be intentional about doing the same for you. Here's what I'm experiencing right now in our relationship here's what feels great to me. Here's where I'm not feeling so great. What I'm wondering is, is missing for me and what's, what's going on with you? Because there, there's a myth that men, because men will sometimes say, uh, well, everything's pretty much fine for me. I mean, she's got, she, she's got some complaints, but I, it, it, so that's not, at, if you watch their behavior, mm. that is not true. They've just, they've been socially conditioned to not even have awareness that they have needs. Mm -hmm. Women have been socially conditioned to be aware that we have needs, but to put our needs under everybody else's. Mm -hmm. So each person is denying their needs in a certain way. So just to open up the conversation to say, like, what's feeling fulfilling to you? What isn't feeling fulfilling, right? Mm -hmm. Each couple is different. For mm -hmm. some, it's like, we're not spending enough time where we're actually present with each other or we're not having enough um, shared experiences of adventure, mm -hmm. exploration, mm -hmm. right? To figure out what, you know, like there are a number of different forms of intimacy, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. right? It's not just emotional and physical. It's spiritual, it's intellectual, it's experiential. So even just the language of that, uh, talking about the different types of intimacy and saying, where do we think that we actually do nourish the intimacy and where are we not attending to it enough? Mm -hmm. 
right? Um, I, I do think it's really important to, to sit with, uh, I use the language of like suffering, how somebody's suffering emotionally a little bit before we jump into solution mode. Okay. So it, it's really, the solutions are helpful. I know guys get a bad rap about that, yeah. but they're brainstorming around solutions. It's very helpful. It's just the timing of it is right. sometimes it's premature. Yeah. Okay. Right. Yeah. So I, I asked that question, you know, knowing that my audience is women and mm. where this conversation initially was, was that this is essentially the burden of the, the woman mm -hmm. just mm -hmm. speaking again, all of this heteronormative for the time yep. being and overly generalized. Right. But yeah. That is our become our burden of taking the emotional temperature of the relationship in your own experience as a parent and just doing the work you do. How with our kids now, do we start to to do this differently with our kids so that maybe mm -hmm. <laughs> the girls and the boys of the next generations, well, maybe I don't even know that much about Gen Z as far as this goes, but the generation that our kids are in, I don't know if that's Gen Z or not, but now I'm babbling, whatever, you know what I mean? <laughs> like, I do. No, what no, do no. I do? No, what, how do we do things differently with our kids? So we don't continue the cycle is what I'm getting at. Okay. So first to get, really get to the root of it, we really need to understand that we are not that different. Mm. Right. So it, that's at the core, because if we're still operating uh, with that myth, we are unconsciously going to interact yeah. with our kids in, in, in differently. Right. So just to really understand that um, we are, we're humans, we're humans, we are all capable of learning these skills, you know, emotional, relational skills. So that's mm. for starters, because what I see is like my, my brother has all those skills, you know we're seventies kids mm. because we grew up speaking that language, mm. right? My son has one because my ex and I were very conscious about having those conversations around emotional awareness, right? And also understanding that each child is, is different. And some kids, you know, wanna talk about what happens that distress them that day right away. And others wanna sit and reflect for a bit and then talk about it and right. But um, it's, yeah, it's really listening to our kids and being curious about what's going on and and you know all of that having a conversations the same way with 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 each child with some tweaks based on mm -hmm. how they you know emotionally process mm -hmm. right yeah all right and you mentioned um a few times and I know from following you and and whatnot mm -hmm. that you know you talk about your your experience your divorce experience as being from a nice guy right like yep. and you yep. mentioned it earlier there wasn't this like big moment right like talk to some of the challenges that we might not realize about that type of divorce because I think we often hear about the other right the traumatic yeah. angry yeah. you know tumultuous situation mm -hmm. talk to me about some like I said some of the challenges of the situation like that you were in that we might not think of we not realize yeah. So one of the biggest challenges of it is how you kind of gaslight yourself in it, because mm -hmm. even though, you know, like for me as somebody who uh, is, you know, is intuitive, like I get and is in touch with my emotions. Mm -hmm. I also looking back on it, realized that I was starting to feel sad in the relationship. Mm -hmm. There wasn't, uh, there wasn't enough of certain types of intimacy it wasn't fulfilling enough. And yet, because he's such a good and kind man, mm -hmm. I kept convincing myself that I didn't have the right to, to feel that mm -hmm. I knew, I, I knew at a gut level. And if I really would, had allowed myself to explore those feelings of sadness, grief, it was a sense of loss, right? It was a, a grief around loss of connection, mm -hmm. right? That the connection was feeling a little to surface sometimes. And, uh, and I was telling myself, trying to convince myself that I should be happy enough in it because exactly like you said, we weren't screaming at each other. We were still engaged. We were still cuddling. We were, you know, there was yeah. still affection. There was still care. There was still a lot of respect and admiration, mm -hmm. right? We were very supportive of each other's careers. There were a lot of foundational pieces there. 
mm-hmm. um, and then some missing. Uh, there, there stopped being enough, even though we, we both have a good sense of humor, play is another really important element of love. Mm-hmm. And at, at the end, I was like, there's not enough play mm-hmm. for me, right? Um, so I think that one of the challenges there is that you convince yourself that you don't have the right to feel as sad as, as you are. Mm-hmm. And that's what I see in people. When I'm sitting with people who are still in that phase of denying it, they are so sad, mm. right? Yeah. And, they're, and they're trying to convince themselves to stay yeah. because they don't want to hurt, to hurt this other person, right? So it's like the, the self-sacrifice of that. We're like, yeah. if I'm true to myself, I'm causing emotional suffering to my partner, to my kids, Right. And, and what will everyone, you know, everyone on the outside thinks this looks fabulous. Yeah. Yeah. Right. So it's that self denial and self betrayal and like the emotion, our emotions are there to give us information. And had I tuned into my sadness a little earlier, I don't know, maybe I could have gotten to the root of it. Yeah. It's, it's making me think of, you know, we've been talking a lot about gender norms and, and things like that. And it's, it's also just as you're talking, it's like, here I am in, in a marriage, right. That mm-hmm. um, I, I love, I'm happy in, and mm-hmm. I wouldn't change anything about it. Well, that, you know what I mean about being married. <laughs> yeah. Right. Yeah. Um, but it's reminding me of all the conversations I've had with divorce coaches and, you know, therapists who specialize in, in marriage counseling and things. And, we have such a high value in this society on marriage and what it means. And ultimately, be, okay, what am I trying to say? I'm trying to say that I don't think my relationship as it is now would mm-hmm. be much different without that piece of paper. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But yep. to dismantle it because of that piece of paper would be would be often would be what might keep me in it right like I don't know mm-hmm. it's just the mm-hmm. the the uh, uh, it's like mm-hmm. because of the value that we've put on marriage and what it means we're actually to the detriment of yeah. happiness I, I, I agree because that because of that piece of paper it sometimes slides into the assumption of love yeah right yeah. Uh, the same dynamics, though, I do think play out in most long term relationships. Okay. Right. So even if they don't have a, the piece of paper, okay. if they're in it for a number of years, the same dynamics are playing out. The difference, as a friend pointed out to me the other day, who his way of moving through life is I will never get married, mm. is yeah, but I can walk away, you know, and so can my partner. Yeah. more easily because we don't have that piece of paper right yeah. it's not uh, like legal fees and that yeah. are going to put you in debt and you know all that yeah Man, that's just it's just crazy okay yeah yeah so, it, so- it's it's also the one and done idea right like I think that uh, uh-huh. it, I, I do think that we're at a stage where um it's time for relationships to catch up to to where we're at right mm. it, this is it's not the 1950s anymore. Things have changed in some ways. I mean, right. unfortunately yeah. not in others, but right. uh, so in terms of relationships, it's really the call for each partner to share the load of cultivating the connection, mm-hmm. right? It cannot still be on one person, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. right? Yeah. And so it, it's that, that the one and done idea it, it sounds very romantic and lovely. I don't think that it's the only model we should be focused on. Yeah. Yeah. All right. And, and you said it earlier and I, if, if we've already talked about it, just make the connection for me, but okay, 80% of divorces are initiated by women. Yes. Why is that? Uh, because they are the ones monitoring the closeness. Okay. All right. And so they are tuned in to the suffering around disconnection earlier mm-hmm. and and more consistently. And then when they're bringing it to their partner, as they often do, mm-hmm. and their partner doesn't join them in and learning how to reconnect, right, which involves learning some new skills often, yeah. right? Uh, 
then their heart starts kind of pulling out and then it's just it okay. just feels like this isn't worth it anymore okay all right thank you and so now in in the work you do and just you know maybe even at home like when when someone's going to come now for coaching mm -hmm. what is the actual work look like what is the process of working with you look like uh, it looks like first them identifying here are the areas that I would love to focus on, right? Rather than like specific goals straight out of the Hold gate. On, can I clarify something? Yes. Are people, are you seeing clients one-on-one -on -one or as a couple or both? Both. Okay, go ahead. Both. Sorry. Go so ahead. yeah, so some, some people um, are just coming because they would love to work on their own development, right? Mm. Um, their own growth. Mm -hmm. And others want their own growth and relational growth. So it it, it just depends. Um, so you're you're talking about where they would like to focus their their energy and their growth. You're looking for where the strengths are mm -hmm. to build upon those, to use some of those um, for the areas where they're feeling a little stuck. Right. And then in the sessions, you're real time practicing. Okay. you know, some of these, um, techniques, uh, and then, and then also giving them, uh, early on in coaching, there's often some exploration. There's an exploration phase. So it's a combination of, uh, let, let's pull out some more knowledge and then how can we then apply the insight you gain from that to actionable steps, right? Cause if you, if you, you know, there's this idea about coaching, that is so focused on action. And sometimes if you talk about what would be an actionable step too early, then you're kind of setting your clients up to, like, for example, I used to do quite a bit of career coaching, right? And the clients would come in like, okay, I want you to like really kind of, you know, push me to get out there and job search and get those resumes up. Well, we don't know what's blocking you in the first place. Right. right. So that's premature, right? You yeah. know, like, let's figure out what's compromising your your clarity around that, your sense of worth around that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, where, like, I don't, I just jotted down as you were talking, you know, talked a lot about the relationship, the, the partner relationship. Mm -hmm. What about, what about the one with ourselves? Like mm -hmm. where, where do we, where do we start to explore that? What, I don't know. Do you have, yeah. Do I need to I keep do. talking or do you have things that you can say? <laughs> yeah. So <laughs> one of the, the big ones is really uncovering the, as you'll hear a lot of coaches talk about, really uncovering the unconscious beliefs that are running the show. Mm. And I pull them out of people rather than out, it, through stories, right? You're, you're listening to their narrative, the stories that they're telling about themselves, about what's possible for them, about, you know, um, one of the things I'm tuning into are the statements that people make, what they insist is true about themselves. And I'm like, is it though? Right. So a, a lot that? of, yeah, <laughs> yeah. You know, how did you, how did you come to believe that? Mm. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, because then you are going to unconsciously invite in situations that confirm that. And you're going to be so focused, unconsciously focused on confirming it, confirmation bias, um, that you will then insist even further to me that it's fact right? Mm -hmm. What would happen if you didn't believe that? So um, you pull it out through the stories and you play around with, with shifting that uh, so that they are expanding not only their understanding of themselves and what they're capable of, but their self-worth. Mm -hmm. um, I talk a lot about self-compassion because when you listen to how most of us speak to ourselves at the very moment where we need support, understanding, we we then bully ourselves yeah we're horrible <laughs> yeah and and the science of it which i've learned this from um self-compassion researcher Kristen neff is mm -hmm. that when we speak to ourselves in that critical way we are putting ourselves into threat response right mm -hmm. we're activating our nervous system in that way so that's a big one most of us are fairly lousy at speaking to ourselves in a compassionate way so I work with people on coming up with a self-compassion script until the point where it becomes an automated process. But initially it's really helpful to have it written out and consciously practice that uh, daily 
and not just waiting until you're in distress. Right. 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 So that's a big one too. And paying attention to the signs from your body, from your intuition, your emotions about what is for you, what lights you up, what feels good and what doesn't. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Again, we get, we get way too in our heads about everything and we disconnect. Yeah. I'm in the middle of, um, Holly Whitaker's quit like a woman. Yeah. And she just, she has a chapter where she's like, things I will F with and things I will not F with. And uh-huh. it's like everything uh-huh. from like mayo to cigarettes. You know what I mean? <laughs> yes. Like, yes. It's yes. just it reminded me of that. Um, yeah. I want to ask you too, just, I, this was maybe six months ago now I mm-hmm. had a conversation with Heather Chauvin and mm-hmm. she's a coach and mm-hmm. I was interviewing her and we really had a, a clarity moment for me in the interview where I was able to make the connection that what part of what was blocking my next breakthrough in self-development mm-hmm. was feeling unsure of how my development would affect the relationship. How do we, yeah, like how do we marry, for lack of a better word, how do we grapple with self-development and the intersection of it with our relationships? Mm -hmm. Well, um, the interesting thing is I think that, uh, especially in North America, there's a lot of talk about self-development and I'm not convinced it is actually self-development. I think most of our development is co-development. So if you are right, you know, it's, it's um, our, if our relationship is, is healthy, whether it's with a coach, a therapist, a friend, right. If they are, if they are mutually growth fostering relationships, that's another thing I think to focus on in our intimate relationship. Hmm. Um, So what you brought up, I think happens for a lot of people. And I think uh, some people will unconsciously hold their growth back, stifle it, play small so that it doesn't threaten the relationship. So your awareness around that, I think is amazing. Even just tapping into that awareness and, and playing it out like, Ooh, how is this going to affect the relationship? Mm -hmm. Right? So if we're not growing Mm. throughout, we we are wired to grow. We are wired to evolve. Mm -hmm. And so we also want to talk about for ourselves and in our relationships, what does that look like? How are we focusing on our, our growth? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So in, in thinking about co-development mm-hmm. and based on, you know, the rest of this conversation, I'm thinking yeah. about that in relation to my spouse mm-hmm. is is this where, you know, I know you talk a lot about like authentic love, like, is this Mm -hmm. where you would start to maybe not start, but is this an area where you would feel like, okay, if we're, we're doing this together, this is what would be considered authentic and, and what wouldn't like, what's talk to me about the differentiation of authentic love versus just what we might think of as love. Yeah. So, um, yes, another one of the components of authentic love would be that there, that you're both growing, right. There's, um, there's, there's something called the, the relational cultural theory, and it talks about growth fostering relationships, which I I, I think is really part of it, right? Like is our, is our zest increasing Hmm. as we're in this relationship? Is our, is our, this is a huge one. Is our self-worth increasing in mm-hmm. this relationship so that's like a key sign that something is off if mm-hmm. your self-worth is is decreasing right now again you're playing around with a balance you want to be solely dependent on the relationship for your self-worth right mm-hmm. you want to cultivate it however if remaining in the relationship is compromising your self-worth there's a problem is your sense of of self-knowledge and clarity and that for your partner expanding do you feel like connecting even more with the world, Mm. Mm -hmm. you know, because the relationship is healthy or are you starting to shrink? Mm. Right. So that's another topic to explore with your partner in terms of authentic love. Mm -hmm. Right. And, and it's, this isn't like 
consistent all the time. We we we, right. we fall off the tracks, right? We, yeah. we become disconnected from ourselves and, and from others. You know, I talk to people a lot about that sense of creating that, that like internal sense of home. Mm. Because throughout the day, we will have moments where we disconnect from ourselves, disconnect from others. How do you find your way back? And I think it's especially important to think of it um, as that internal sense of it, because some people grew up in houses and in, you know, in a residence that didn't feel like home emotionally. Right. Yeah. How do you, Gemma, find your way back home? What do you do to take care of yourself? I, I, I check in with myself more regularly now, right? And that's something that I learned at the end of the marriage too. It was like all the ways that I would remain so connected with clients or friends, but then on my time alone, I was numbing out a little too much because I didn't want to look at the truth of what was happening. Mm. Um, and that kind of disconnection from yourself is so painful. Uh, and there's kind of like a recovery process from that. So I check in with my, in the morning, um, and I go over this with clients too, a check-in about like, what am I feeling? What's my energy level connected to those emotions? Um, what's the story I'm telling myself about that if I recognize I'm a little distressed, right? And what do I need in this moment or in this hour or right to, to connect with myself? And it's going to be different each day. Mm -hmm. I don't want to be like rigid about, I have to meditate at this time, take a walk at this, right? You want to really like what do I need today because mm -hmm. we're always <laughs> right it's always yeah. changing I laughed I w people won't be able to see you but she did a little, oh. a little like vibey <laughs> the, move the there. body flow yeah yeah yeah, yeah. right yeah so there's yeah. days where you're feeling quite playful and you want to savor that and how can I kind of ride that wave if I wake up and I'm feeling like very energetic and playful how can I consciously nourish that mm hmm Mm -hmm. If I'm feeling another way where I need a little more comfort or how, how do I respond to that? Yeah. Curious. You mentioned the recovery process from, you know, disconnecting from yourself. Was there a moment where you said, okay, like the process, I did the process. I'm, I'm, I'm healed. Like, I'm good. Yeah. Like I, I know the answer is probably no, but what did the healing process look like for you? And when did you start to feel like, you know, you got your feet on the ground a little bit? Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, it's, in, in some ways, it's kind of hard to explain because it's just this feeling of yeah. like, ah, I feel so much more me. The and I almost needed that contrast because yeah. I would have said before, like, I thought I was being true to myself, right? Yeah. Um, but it's that it's, it's also energy is a big part of it is mm -hmm. like feeling the again the, it's like the desire to engage more with the world because you're feeling more like yourself you're mm -hmm. feeling you know your self-worth has expanded you're excited about possibilities and uncertainty doesn't feel so scary anymore because it's like ooh, that's where the exciting things can happen because you don't know what's going to happen mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah and to kind of like bring it full circle for yeah. me I know that when I want to be engaged on my social media platforms, I'm yeah. in a good headspace. Yes, when I'm pulling that's a away, good point. I'm like, I have no interest in it whatsoever. Yes. Yeah. I, I think what you just said is, is, is such a great thing to, um, to note and to like, in terms of checking in with ourselves, am I in a space of feeling like I want to approach life, my thoughts, my friend, whatever, or, or am I feeling like I want to withdraw and avoid? Yeah. Yeah. Up. It's funny. I usually, I, I've, I've said this before when I am feeling deep in some level of growth or development, I yeah. do retreat okay. from the world, but I also know that I do that in a depressive state too. So, mm -hmm. um, it's, it's just funny to me that So I then how do you yeah. know? So then what's the other piece? How do you know, oh, this is because I'm feeling down versus I'm focused mm -hmm. on my growth? Yeah, energy, yeah, okay. right? Yeah. Right, like yeah. energy, depressive is just really having no care about anything and low mm -hmm. energy, low fatigue, like, you know, fatigue and just nothing seems 
yeah happy like I'm like and I know yeah. that's a cliche but it's like the things that I would go to to bring me joy don't um yeah whereas the other it's not sunshine and roses it's not happy mm -hmm. necessarily it's just mm -hmm. I have the awareness of perhaps this is hard but I'm doing mm -hmm. something like I'm working at something um my yeah. my listeners have been on a body image journey with me for the okay. last year. And, <laughs> okay. and that's really what's coming to mind for me is, okay. you know, this is something that comes up almost every therapy session in one way or another, really unpacking this. And I'm at a point now with it where to think about it, talk about it, be in this body doesn't make me depressed, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but it's such active work to just show up in the world in this body that I'm in. Yeah, that it's different. Yeah. I'm not like down and out about it, but I know I'm, I'm still in the weeds with it. You know, I'm not. Yeah. I'm, it's, you know, I can look it's, back it's and see the process. progress. Right. But mm -hmm. it's like, it consumes my thoughts <laughs> a lot of the time. Yeah. And, and, and do you find that you're focused now on more aspects of it? Yeah, totally. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's something that and whether it's body image or it's parenting or it's my relationship mm -hmm. or whatever it is, it, it almost makes it such that like, there's an aspect of it that I say to myself, we can't fix everything. We can't work on everything all at once. Right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But there's also a very much like that compartmentalizing aspect of it, of, I almost can't work on other things when I'm this deep in something. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Yeah, I understand that. Yeah. yeah. And it sounds also like you are shifting to the focus of growth rather than fixing. Yes. Sort of. Right. <laughs> sort of. <laughs> some days. Some days. Yeah. Some, some days. But I, I think days. even what you mentioned about happiness, I think we get so overly focused on happiness mm -hmm. rather than the full range of emotions that, that are more pleasant, right? Because for me, even just having a day where I feel really uh, excited about learning something new or like that's a good indication for me that I'm doing okay when my curiosity is really peaked mm -hmm. I'm like this is gonna be a good day yeah right I don't have yeah. to feel happy I just want to feel kind of alive mm. interested engaged yes. in some way right? yeah that, that's a good that's a really good distinction because I tip it I also if it's not my body image it's it's making the um yeah I don't know I'm trying I'm trying to decide how big of a can of worms I want to open with the next <laughs> three minutes here but you know it's I'm home with my kids and my toddlers a lot and yeah. I really don't think that that life is for me <laughs> um yeah. as far as being home every day all day with them and you know today they're at school and I posted about this the other day I you know I feel like by the time I kind of get in a good groove creatively, it's time to pick them mm. up. And, mm. and I guess what I'm, where, where I'm relating it to what you're saying is I'm never overly happy to play trucks and dress oh, up neither and was I. do yeah. dinosaurs, mm -hmm. but I can tell the difference of when I'm just present and accepting mm -hmm. of the situation versus mm -hmm actively frustrated about yeah. having to play trucks or yes. get the 40th snack of the day and mm -hmm. and the contrast becomes so apparent to me mm -hmm. based on how the two days a week go where they're not home with me yeah it's like yeah. you, you need have, that contrast to learn yeah I yeah. have the contrast and it's like you know, on a day like today where they're not home, if I had a really awesome, productive day, I'm so mm -hmm. much happier to do trucks tomorrow. Mm -hmm. But on those, mm -hmm. the days where they're not here and maybe I'm, am depressed or I am this, it's like, mm -hmm. I almost, you know, like I said, this is a whole big can of worms. So I'm it is. Gonna... <laughs> Cause even when you say, even when you say productive, that kind of lights something up yeah, for me. Right. Cause yeah. I, I also think we're conditioned to think that uh, our worth is contingent upon productivity. And it, 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 it's like, if you, if you look at the, um, the other layers, the details 
of a day when you feel good at the end of it, I bet you it's way more than productivity for you. Yeah. I bet you it's using your mind in certain ways. It's being intrigued in certain ways. It's being connected to other people, having meaningful, like, look at what you do with this podcast, having meaningful conversations. Yeah. It's, it's, it's probably that even more than productivity. Yeah. 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 Right. Well, yeah. Yeah. Connected to I your values. I always feel better after I, I, even if I'm having a fine day yeah. after a call like this, and after an interview, yeah. it's like, I'm jazzed, you know, I'm fired up. It's like, okay, I've connected because you're with engaged. someone. Yeah, yes, exactly. So yeah. I, I think that, 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 so that's another, in terms of connection to self and in our relationship, it's conversations around our values. That is another great conversation to have with your partner mm. is, and our values in terms of how we prioritize our core values, they can change over time, mm -hmm. right? So you recognizing, I'm not super excited about getting down on the floor and playing with trucks <laughs> for the fifth time. To, neither was I. I, uh, oh my and, God. And, but however, if you have other sources that are, you know, of activities where you feel really engaged, then suddenly you do have the energy and you can get into that a little more. Right. Yeah. But if it's only that, and you don't have your other sources of activities that are connected to your core values, yeah. then you suffer. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> Right. And, and uh, people often don't consciously, unless they're in coaching or therapy, sit and uh, like assess where am I at right now with my core? Like a lot of people, I don't really know what yeah. my core values are. Right. Yeah. And even, but even though, you know, it always like, it always just is amazing to me. I'm in therapy. I have conversations like this on a weekly mm -hmm. basis. I consume mm -hmm. content like yeah. this all the time and even just now mm -hmm. saying out loud how much more easily willingly and happily I will play trucks uh, after I've had time to engage and fulfill myself how many times have I heard that how many times have I heard you know you can't pour from an empty cup and you have to take care of yourself first. Put your your oxygen yeah. mask on before you, you put on yes. other things. Like I've heard yeah. it so many times. I've heard it so many times. I consume it. I'm in therapy. I have this these conversations. And it still took me till just now to say out loud and kind of truly make it real for me to go, oh, that's what they mean. Because... Yeah, you can still get so wrapped up in the the shame and the guilt and, you know. It, yes, it, it's the. Um, I mean, that's another thing that I think happens in therapy and in coaching. It's really a, a gaining a, a better understanding of what are the beliefs and behaviors that have been conditioned in me. Yeah. So within that, I would say there's something that is about that a, a belief that you have to sacrifice your own desires and interests and all that to make sure everyone else is yeah. okay for and 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 especially as a woman yeah that's been drilled into you right and yeah. so a lot of the things we think are very true about ourselves they're not they're conditioned yeah and the more we go oh how can I release that a little bit at a time and get back to who I truly am a little bit less truck on the floor time a little bit more engagement in my interests yeah right yeah yeah, yeah. and 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 you know I think for me too, it was not just the conditioning that I should put everyone's needs and wants before mine, but that I should want to. Yes. Good point. Yes, you know? absolutely. Of course Otherwise, I should want to play what trucks kind of with a my woman son. Are you? Yes. Uh -huh. Of course yeah. I should want to put meals on the table and, you know, yes. like there's something inherently wrong with me if I don't want to. Absolutely. And so it's, it's the messages you like, luckily for me early on, I heard messages about the importance of everybody, mm. you know, being able to find a way to be engaged with their interests and their gifts and all of that. Right. So before I even had kids with my ex, I was like, this is going to be a 50, 50 situation mm. because I knew like you, I knew I will be bored out of my mind if I'm like building blocks all day. I, I do want to do some of that, right? Of course. but I don't yeah. only want to do that. I yeah. have to keep my mind stimulated so that I continue growing or I'm not going to be as good a mom. You know? Yeah. 
Okay. All right. I've kept you over now, but is, if there, is there anything, any final thoughts, anything still lingering on your mind that you want to make sure you add to this conversation? Anything I didn't think to ask you, or I don't know, anything that just sitting on no, your No, you asked, you asked great questions. I think, I, I think I would just wrap it up by saying it's just, it's just about learning more for people. It's just about moving into curiosity. What more is there to learn? Mm-hmm. Um, you know, in terms of how to engage with my growth and my own evolution. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, Gemma, thank you so much. This was great. And uh, very fun. Whoa. Okay. So much to unpack here. I am going to try to do this conversation justice and take two points that really stand out to me and share them with you. The first was the idea of sliding into the assumption of love. The assumption of love then turns into care, which is all great and fine, but not enough. I thought this was so insightful. Can't you hear yourself saying in a relationship or honestly, even in a breakup, you know, I care about you so much. But have you had someone say that to you in a breakup? Because I have, you know, I care about you so much, but it's not working or da 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 whatever. Um, but it is just that, it, you know, the caring isn't enough. But I think it's interesting when you think about a longstanding relationship. I'm in a 12, yeah, I think it's 12 year long relationship. And of course I care about my partner. But I can also very much sit here and, you know, for lack of a better way to say it, evaluate and know that I also love him, that they that they're there's two different things and they come together. But I can see how over time, if some of the things that Gemma was talking about, like deepening the connection, keeping things interesting and passionate, having conversations beyond what you would have with a neighbor without those things. Your relationship could easily turn into a relationship of caring, a relationship where you feel like, wow, we share kids together or we've just been together so long. It's so comfortable. And of course, I care about this person. It's like I care about this person as as someone who's been in my life for a long time, as the co-parent of my kid. But do I love them? And I think, like I said, when you're in the at the point of being in a long term relationship, I can imagine that being a very confusing place to navigate. And I might add where a coach or a therapist could be very helpful. Um, Anyway, I just thought that was really interesting and had never heard someone explain it that way before. And the second point that, of course, sticks out is, you know, about self-denial, self-betrayal, self-sacrifice. You know, Gemma spoke about it from the point of view of having a really nice guy for a husband and not wanting to hurt him or their family. But in doing so, she denied her true self, what she desired and wanted. And I think I think we all always need this reminder because whether we're facing it in our relationships, our jobs, our self-care practice, or our lack thereof, when we sacrifice ourselves, our beliefs, our wants, and our needs for too long, you know, I, just nothing good can come from it, truly. <laughs> so, all right, I, you know, I, I could keep going and deep diving everything Gemma said, but I know I'd ultimately end up just rephrasing what she already said oh so well. So thank you, Gemma. Thank you for listening. Where you can find Gemma and all of her resources are, of course, linked in the show notes. And I will see you next time. Bye. Thank you so much for tuning in today. Sass Says is a production of Luann Nigara, Inc. This podcast is meant to be educational and not meant to replace professional therapy or professional medical attention. To learn more about today's show and what's new in my world, head over to sasssays.com. Thanks so much. Talk later. Thank you.